what you're doing is working. So you know what my advice is when stuff works? Don't change it because there's no reason to change it. I think your issue is this. This has to get off your plate tomorrow, like ASAP because this is your bottleneck. It's actually hilarious. Your bottleneck is you can't take more clients. You can handle more clients if you get that off. The bottleneck is you. Guess what those clients do? Whine, moan, complain, you suck, I hate, like those are the worst clients. I think if you do that, I will be shocked if you can't hit 100K within 60 days. There's no way. I don't see it. It's impossible. So my name's Selena. I'm from Michigan. I actually just graduated college a couple months ago and I run a marketing agency. So trying to scale it, I work with med spas doing done for you, call center, appointment setting, ads. I'm just trying to build out the team and scale it up, so. I kind of got into it last year during college. I just was trying to figure out what else I could do besides the route that I was going down, which was medicine. I just wasn't super passionate about it. And I always really liked business. So I think running an agency is a great beginner business model. So that's why I just kind of was like one foot in, one foot out. And then now these past few months, I've just been going all in on it. He posts a lot of like sales, business content. So I was just following his content and it's been helpful. Just tips and tricks and sales and been helpful, yeah. I wouldn't really say I have like hard expectations, but I'm excited just to kind of pick his brain a little bit and see like how he would think about the bottlenecks that I'm facing. Cause I'm sure they're super common and that he's faced them too. So I'm excited just to dive in and see where it goes. What's going on? Hey Tanner. Hey, how are you doing? Good, good. Nice to meet you. Um, I'm Selena. I came in from Michigan. Oh, awesome. So, yeah, I'm super excited. No way. I just flew in last night. Wow, awesome. Well, I'm super excited here. It's a little different weather, yeah? It, yeah? it is. The sun, I can't <laughs> complain. <laughs> That's awesome. I'm super glad you're here. Well, yeah, start off with what are you offering and then start giving me some stats. You know, revenue, employees, like any of those types of things. Okay, so I'm doing marketing agency okay. work with med spas okay done for you so we do the ads facebook instagram um do call center okay book and appointments with who's a call center is. like did you outsource that is it your call center uh philippines okay so you outsource it okay. but it's internal so it's internal but oh so it is yours yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. okay awesome great med spas is a good market yeah and team size i have a media buyer i have three isas and then one media buyer. one media buyer i'm sorry okay go ahead and then I just brought on a CSM. Okay, so like client success manager? Yeah. Okay, and then do you have coaches underneath him or her? No. Okay, so it's just that's one person to do the fulfillment. Or I guess they're managing they're managing these people, correct? No, so okay. they're taking care of like check-in calls. Okay. But not yet, they're still in training. Got it. So they're a couple weeks in. Okay. Um, and yeah, that is the team size. Okay, and then you obviously. So you got one, two, three, four, or five. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, Revenue, it's been at 30K for the past couple months. Okay. This month is probably gonna be 40 to 50. Nice, awesome. So I'm trying to scale, but okay. right now, I think I've just been a little bit bogged down by fulfillment and especially training the CSM. Okay. So January, February, I was taking a lot of sales calls. I was just getting a lot of unqualified sales calls. Okay. So I changed some things up. Now I'm not really getting sales calls. Interesting. Okay. Um, so sales is one bottleneck, but I'm also trying okay. to figure out how to remove myself a little bit and, and still scale the team and train yep. while, while scaling, you know. Scaling, team. Yeah. Okay. Then, All right. Oh yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, you're um, doing great. This is, you're awesome. I love it. Just for also another thing that I think is relevant is we're at about 30 clients to like more, a little above 30. So that's why I was looking at the numbers too, um, trying to make sense of it. Like how we're at 30 clients. And, and you're only at like 30 K. Yeah. It's um, not, that seems like quite a bit. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if I'm undercharging too. I'm doing 1750 per month for the done for you. Okay. We'll find it. I mean, we find out that's good. 1750 per month. What else yeah. you got? Anything? You're doing great. This is all relevant. So, um, I can give you some numbers. Okay. Where would be kind of relevant start? Well, let me start. Yeah. I'll just start asking you. media buyers. What do you pay them? 750 a month. Okay. So they're foreign, right? Yeah. Nice. Appointment setters. A couple of them are part-time, Okay. but usually like 600 to 800. Okay. So it's cheap per month. Yeah. Yeah. So you're paying nothing. Okay. Uh, CSM. Um, 3,400. Okay. Foreign or domestic? 
Uh, Canadian based. Okay, so basically, we'll say domestic just because Canadian. So it's close. It's close enough to Michigan, right? So <laughs> these are these are all foreign and then domestic. Yeah. And then just so I'm clear, media buyers are running the ads for you and your clients, correct? Just clients. Just clients. Appointment setters are calling your clients' leads. Yes. They're not calling your leads. No. Or they do both? No, just clients leads. Just clients leads. Okay, so who runs your ads for your leads and who is calling your leads, if anyone? I run my own ads. Okay, you do the ads? Okay. I was doing straight to booking. Okay. So I wasn't really calling leads. Okay. Um, What's your I funnel look like? So they click the ad, what happens? Okay, so I just changed it up a couple weeks ago. Tell me what you did before and tell me what you're doing now. Yeah, so I was just doing straight, like a video ad, straight to my calendar page. Holy sh like Calendly? Um, like this? Go high level, like just with testimonials at the bottom. Okay, so that's fine. So go high level testimonials and then from here, it's just like a thank you page. That's so like, hey, you booked your call, et cetera. Is that yeah, it? with the VSL. Okay. On this page? Yeah. Interesting. And then this is a 15 minute call, right, right here. So the 15 minute, right? So they go to this page and then it's 15 minutes. They book and then thank yeah. you page VSL and then you have the 15 minute call. Is that accurate? Yeah, so they okay. would book for 15 minutes, but I would mm -hmm. really just try to one call close them and it would be Zoom, not like a foot call. Oh, really? Okay, so just so I'm clear, they click the ad, they book for 15 minutes, they watch the VSL, and then you finagle a 60 minute. Yeah. How did that work? <laughs> okay, it was... <laughs> it was... <laughs> wow, I've never, I've never actually heard that before. I'm so curious now. Okay. It was, it was doing pretty good in January, February. But what started happening is just, I was getting so many calls that like, it would just be two back to back. Okay. And I would have to schedule follow-ups and- Oh yeah, but like, why wouldn't you just, I guess like what I don't understand is why would you, it almost feels like it's a trick. Why not do a 15 minute call? Like phone call? Well, yeah, so so th they think this is 15 minutes, right? Yeah. And then you're doing a 60, like why? Why, why not just tell them it's the 60 like off the bat or something? I thought that it would lower booking rate. Yeah, but but then like what's happening here? I guess I'm curious like what the numbers are. I mean, how many people get on this call and they're like, I thought it was 15 minutes, then you're talking to them for an hour. Like no one. Really? Yeah. Okay, so I mean, has it worked? It has, but I mean, they're not all necessarily one call closes. There'll be follow-ups. Okay, how long do the calls take? Do they actually take an hour? Well, that's, that's maybe just me trying to get better at sales, but usually if it is a one call close, it can be like 60 to 90 minutes. Yeah, 90 is a long time. Anything over 60, I usually think is too long. Yeah. Okay, but that's fine. Like, I guess that's what you did then. What are you doing now? And then if I can get any numbers, that's gonna help me. So meaning mm -hmm. what your CTR was, how many people book a call, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but but start, with, start with the next funnel you're doing now, and then you can give me numbers. Yeah, so I changed it pretty much at the start of March. Okay. Everything is the same, except it goes from ad to a survey landing page. Yep. Um, and yeah, I, I was, uh, there, there was one guy we already had and he did something like this too, survey, okay. And the yeah. survey is just longer often basically. And then can they book a call on the survey or it's the next page? It's the next page. Yeah, so then the call here is 15 minute, right? And then you do the VSL yeah. and then call, right? Is this a 60 minute call or 15? I changed the time to 30. Okay, so 30 and then, but you're still trying to close them all on the same call. Yeah. Right? Okay. So I need to know numbers on this. And then if you have numbers on this first. So what's your numbers on this? Meaning how many people, I guess you don't know this number. You would know how much you spend, but you don't know how many people see the page. You would know how many books. So I guess I'm curious, how much do you spend in a month? How many people book? And then how many people show up? I guess that's what I'd like to know. Yeah, I can give you the numbers for January and February. Okay. What's that? Just give me, give me the most recent or give me the average because i don't want to have both months well i you give me both months that's fine yeah give me both months before yeah they're pretty much the same okay january i spent two thousand on ads cost per booking was about thirty dollars i was getting a lot of unqualified i had a 4.4 roas so cost per acquisition was 335 and then for february it was about the same okay i spent 2200 roughly the same 30 dollar cost per booking um 5.5 ROAS okay. and $319 cost per acquisition. Okay, so my question is why are you changing? Because I was getting a lot of people who, so I basically have like zero to 5K, five to 10, 10 to 15, 15 to 20, and like, you know, different ranges. Like what do you, what ranges for what? Like what their monthly revenue is. Okay, yeah. So I have that option on the calendar page uh -huh. and I was getting a lot of people who were just zero to five and okay. they were closing but I was just getting too many unqualified calls and for just being so back-to-back -back with 
still doing account management and everything, I wanted to maybe get more qualified. Yeah, but why not have someone else take this call and then schedule a sales call with you? That's the whole, you know, you realize that's the point, right? I, you're the only person I've had. How many SMMA people have we had now? Like six? Six or seven. You're the only person I've ever heard that does a 15 minute call and then tries to like do a 60 minute call, which isn't bad because look, look, in your defense, look, money talks. But the problem you're having is you can't scale it because you're too busy. So the good thing you've done, here's good news. You brought in a CSM, why? So they can take over the fulfillment. That should have been the first thing that you did in the first place. So you should have done that a long time ago. If you're doing 30 to 50K a month, you should have had a CSM a long time ago, especially when you're paying uh, what I call peasant fees. Like this is nothing. You don't even feel that. You know, it's like three grand, like who cares? This is the most you're gonna have. So I'm not against this, but the, the issue you're gonna run into is at scale, the only way this will work is if a sales rep comes in and does both right now, because that your revenue isn't high enough, right? To have like a full-time sales rep. So they do both, so you'd pay them a half setter, half sales rep, so they get 10% commission on clothes, and you pay them a setter fee here. But the other option that I'm just throwing out there is you could just easily have someone who does these calls and they set the sales call. So then what happens is you're not wasting all your time. I guess what I'm curious about is 2,000 divided by 30. Okay, so you had 66. How, did you have 66 people show up? How many actually showed up, do you know? January, I had about 51 scheduled calls. Okay, how many showed? And about a 60% show rate, so 30 live calls. Okay, so 51 and 30, what about February? 75 calls booked, Okay. 36 showed, so about 50%. Yeah, so now I'm gonna ask you, why can't you handle that volume? Because if you're looking, if you actually look at it, 30 calls in a month, let's say they're an hour, that's 30 hours. I mean, it's not that many hours. It's only about seven hours a week. So why are you so busy? Like, what are you doing all day? Do you work a lot or do you not work that much? No, I, I work at least like 12. Okay, so what are you doing all the time? That's what I'm, because that, that to me doesn't make sense. But are, is it because you're doing all the fulfillment? Well, so my media buyer, he's not fully on his own. Uh -huh. still, but the thing is with MedSpas mm -hmm. is, this is another thing that I wanted to talk about, but yeah. I'm trying to sub niche so I can productize my service. Okay. But when I'm signing on people in a bunch of different services, because we do a lot of video style ads for our clients, it's almost like recreating it from scratch whenever they want to do a campaign that we've never done Yeah, you got to streamline your fulfillment. Yeah. Okay, but, but let me ask you then, as of now, you're the CSM. You're going back and forth, da 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 and you're doing all that. That's why you're so busy. Is that accurate? Yeah. Okay, so you're in fulfillment. Okay, so here's the good news. You can keep doing this if you get this fixed. This is not the problem right now, at least not yet, at scale. Now, what's your goal? I guess I didn't ask your goal. How much, How big would you like to get this? I wanna get it at least like, at least 100. Okay, so if you clear that off your schedule, you could get, I think you could get to 100 doing this if that's what you wanna do, because that's not that many calls. Even if you were full-time on this, so let's say you did, let's say you had a couple manager meetings and you just did sales calls a day, you could do that, right? There'd be 10 hours plus of work. You do eight sales calls per day, let's say, and then you'd be totally fine. I don't even think at eight sales calls per day, you'd be past 100 grand. So that's not the issue. Tell me what this is, and then let's talk about that. Do you have numbers for this yet or no? It's, or is it just two weeks old though? It's only been a couple weeks. So why'd you switch? That's the question. Why switch? Um, What's the benefit? It is like, are you hoping this survey here gets you less unqualified people or I don't understand? Okay, so I'd say out of everyone who was scheduled, I had maybe like 40% of people who showed up who were actually qualified. For this? Yeah. Okay, so out of the 36 calls, less are qualified. And they're all booking straight, they're, well, yeah, because I mean, you're not qualifying at all. That's the problem. You're not actually qualifying. Do you understand? Like, well, like, like where are you qualifying here? This maybe, but they've already booked the call, so it's too late. Yeah. You don't, I don't want people, so my VSLs, they book on the VSL, and then the VSL has an application, and then we'll cancel it if it's not a good look. So this, what you're hoping to do is this is gonna weed it out, but why would this weed it out? Because you ask more questions? Like what's any different than them booking a call here? They just have to answer more stuff, so then you can cancel it? So it's the same sort of questions as okay. they were already being asked, but yeah. if they answer zero to five, it doesn't take them straight to the booking page, it just puts them in a follow-up sequence. You're using type form. The GHL survey. Okay, so okay, so same thing. So is it is it where they insert numbers and then based on the score they go X Y Z place? Okay, yeah. cool. Okay. Because I was trying to get people who are more financially qualified. Just because I was signing some people who churned in February because they couldn't like they couldn't afford ad spend. Mm -hmm. So that was my goal with that. 
and I don't think it's working as well, but I kind of wanted to try it out. And okay, see. so it all comes down to cost of acquisition. The thing here is if you're getting a 5.5X ROAS, yeah, I mean, okay, this is actually super simple. Uh, are you closer to 20 or 25? You look pretty young. Are you, are you like closer to 20? Or are you- I'm tw 21. Wow, that's impressive. Uh, I, I don't usually ask girls their age, but you just look young, that's great. Okay, so that's amazing. So here's what you need to do. You're gonna get this coach trained up. Once this coach is trained up, you're gonna have one manager call a day. Do you have a call with these people during the days? Yeah, I have a daily meeting with my media buyer. What about these? No? no. Does someone else manage them? I do, it's just mainly over Slack. You don't do any call reviews, nothing? I should be, but it's just time. You don't have any time, right? Well, yeah, so you gotta prioritize. Like, you gotta take care of the client. So here's what you need to do first. This is like number one priority. You gotta get this all off your plate. You shouldn't be doing any fulfillment. You can't, because if you're doing fulfillment, you can't scale. The funny part is if I was on your team right now, for example, I'd be like, yo, keep doing this, and then I'll just quadruple the ad spend or 5X the ad spend, and we'll hit 100K the next month. Yeah. Do you understand? Because look how good your ROAS is. Now, ROAS goes down as you spend more, but let's just do the math. If this held, right, you're almost at, let's just say you're at 40K. If you just spent 10 or 20 grand, you're at 100 grand now, just based off these numbers. Yeah. That's insane cost. That's really good. Now, keep in mind, it doesn't, the, the ROAS won't be as good. And, and your cost of acquisition probably will go up. But hypothetically, let's say this even doubled. So let's say you spent $20,000 and it costs you seven or $800 to get a client. You, it, it wouldn't matter because you're still, you still have plenty of margin. Your margins are really healthy. So this is number one, you're already on top of it. So you're hundred percent on point. You need to get this systematized. Do you know how to manage properly and do SOPs and things of that nature? I mean, I've just been building as I go. So okay. I'm getting it all built out. It's not, I'm kind of just like learning what I don't know mm -hmm. as I as I go. No, you're good. Yeah, you're good. You shouldn't. You don't. You're not supposed to know. Okay, so let, let's walk through this. So for you, the first thing you need to do, everything you're saying is correct, which is great because that means you're smart and you're gonna do very well because you understand strategy. So the way this should work for your media buyers and appointment setters and client success manager is you should have SOPs for everyone. Here's how you do SOPs, it's super simple. You simply list out everything they have. So let me just show you. Because if you do it now, as you scale, mm -hmm. it's gonna save you way more time than if you have to go back and do it. So let me show you an example, okay? So this is the Let's click on his. What we do is we come in and you write out all their tasks, okay? Mm -hmm. So your media buyer. Your media buyer doesn't probably have too many tasks. It's probably one thing, right? Yeah. But you write out all their tasks. Then you're gonna break it down into daily, monthly, whatever. So you see like weekly, et cetera, okay? Once you break it down into the task, you write the task here, right? So it's like checking SODs. He manages a 14, 14 editors. So start a day and end of day. So that's their EODs and SODs. He does a loom. So what he does is he records himself doing it. Then he breaks it down by task, right? Like step one, do this. Step two, do this. Then underneath that, if he has resources, you'd put the resources. So let me show you resources. This is a resource. So here's where you go for this. Here's where you go for that. So to break this out for you, you'd have all their tasks written out. Boom, 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 boom. Then you break it down into daily, weekly, monthly. Most of their tasks, it's daily, right? They don't really have anything they're not doing on a consistent basis. So they do a video recording themselves. Then they're gonna put the tasks, they're gonna write them. And then they're gonna put any resources. So for example, your media buyer, he'd have all the links to all the clients' Facebook managers. He'd have all the resources, like all of it. And if you do that, you're gonna have really good SOPs. And then what happens is then when someone else comes on the team, if he leaves or he gets fired or anything like that, this is all done. So when someone comes on board, we go, guess what? Go through this whole thing and then let us know if you have questions. It's all done, it's always there. You can update it constantly. And then also if anyone on the team doesn't know what someone's supposed to be doing on a day-to-day -day basis, it's in here. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's what I would be doing for your client success manager. So if you really want to teach her, you should record yourself and you also write out all the tasks so she can come in here and she can just pull it up and she can go down and just boom, boom, boom. It's super methodical. That's going to make it way easier. Does that help a little bit or not really? It does. I have a few SOPs like that for like check-in calls, mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. onboarding, pre-launch calls. Okay. But a lot of it is like, so she's shadowing a lot of my check-in calls right yeah. now. And I'm trying to transition her to her leading mm -hmm. the call. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of jumping in and shadowing. Mm -hmm. How do I plan for or build SOPs for things that, you know, questions clients might ask that she might not be able to answer or might not know how to answer? Like She'll just have to come to you or you just have to hire a better person. I mean, like, let me ask you a question. How do I hire a good media buyer? Well, I'll hire someone who's done media buying. Yeah. If you're teaching her, you can. So here's the thing, you have to decide. Unless like I'm missing something, you're you're pretty high profit right now. 
I mean, your profit's pretty good. I think you're making about, let's let's even go off this number. Well, what do you collect? Is this what you're collecting? Or is that your total sales volume? What do you collect per month? This was last month without a CSM. I didn't include any like pay that I'm taking, uh -huh. just the business. Yeah, of course. Yeah. 78% profit margin. Oh, wow, so low. I'm just kidding. Yeah, it's like super high. So here's the decision you can make. Has this person ever done CSM? No, but I think she has a lot of good experience. Okay, meaning what? So she has some sales skills. She's worked in a gym. She's worked a little bit as a woman's coach. Okay, but nothing relevant, right? Like nothing in the same industry. And a little bit of media buying experience. Okay, so what are the types of questions your clients are asking typically? It's mainly navigating, like asking about, oh, this lead who paid a deposit didn't show up or it's, it's a lot of coaching stuff too. Right. A lot of Mets owners can't sell. So we do coaching. Right. Okay. So, so think of it this way. The best type of person for this position is going to know how to do sales, is going to know how to do media buying. And in a perfect world, maybe even has med spa experience, right? Mm -hmm. That's your best, like, would you agree? That's your best case scenario, like best person you can get. Yeah. So here's what you have to decide. This is your decision. You've already made a decision, but you can also reverse it. You have two ways you can handle it. You either pay for upside like you so so what's going to happen is you're banking on her upside which kind of sounds like what you're saying you're like yeah she has some this that she hasn't really done it but like i think she could do it so what the benefit is is you're going to pay less the other thing you could do is you could find someone who's more experienced where you might pay them let's say anywhere between five to 10 K. So you're paying more, but they're gonna come in. They're like, yeah, I know how to media buy. I've done med spa. I know how to do sales. And there's a lot less skills you have to teach. The easy thing with SOPs that's easy to teach is do this, do this, do this. The hard thing to teach is experience. If she doesn't have the experience, she's gonna make a lot of mistakes and then you might be stuck in there longer. Based on what I'm hearing, if you think she can do it and it's gonna take you not that much time, fine. But otherwise, the obvious choice in this scenario is you need this person. This, this doesn't make any sense. You know why you need that person too? Because guess what this person's gonna turn into later on? Your manager of the other people, right? Your margins are 78%. Who gives a shit if you pay them more money? That's the point. The point of paying more money is so you don't have to babysit the little stuff because that's what you're paying for. So like my COO, he gets grand a month. Why? Because I don't have to tell him what to do. He gets it. He knows what to do. I can say, hey, do this and he can execute. Does that make sense? Yeah, I just feel like I've invested so much time pouring into her and she's, she's getting the skills. I understand what you're saying. That's all human nature. Like, I already invest all this time. I'm fine with it. It's your choice. This is your business. That's the cool part. So here's what you have to ask yourself. One, can she get there? Okay. So it's like, can she get to where I need her to go? Because if she can't, you realize you're going to just fire her later, right? Well, I think she can. Okay. So, okay. So check. So she can get there. Yeah. Okay. Number two, how much time do you think it's going to take you? Two more weeks, two more months, two more years. How much time do you think it's going to take you? A month or two. Okay. All right. So one to two months. Okay. So then three is then, is that worth the money I'm saving? So I just want you to look at it this way though. I'm fine with your decision, but I want you to actually look, it's not actually logical, watch. So we said earlier, you're doing about 30 calls a month, right? Yeah. 30 calls a month, you're spending about 2000 on ads. Okay, so check this out. Your ROAS is five, let's say it's five. So you're making $10,000. So for two months, you're gonna have to stay here because you can't spend any more time because you're training her. So basically what's happening is you're doing the same amount of work. You're just making a little less profit, but in the long run, I get, that's the goal. That's how businesses work. But think of it this way. Let's say you found someone who was double. So let's say you pay, you paid them 7,000. So right now you're doing, let's say you're doing 30,000 a month and you're at 78% profit. What, so what is the actual profit? Yeah, just tell me what it is. Monthly profit for February without a CSM was 27,000. Okay, so yeah, with the CSM, let's say, so 27,000, you add on the other three grand, so 23.5. Let's say this is your profit, 23.5. So this is just for the future. I'm fine with your decision. It's not worth, if you think she can get there, it's not worth it for one to two more months. It's to make the change now, but I just want you to see this. So your profit with her is 23.5, all right? Now, you're only taking 30 calls a month. So let's say that comes completely off your plate and now you can take eight calls a day. Let's say you only work five days a week. So that's 40 calls a week. So now you go from 30 calls to 160, you 5 x it. Let's say you 5 x your ad spend. So if you spent $10,000 on ads, let's say your ROAS isn't five, let's just say it's three. So it only goes to three. So here's old way. So here's what you're doing now. We got 2K ad spend. We got 30 calls. So we got 2K ad spend, we got 30 calls. And then we got 23.5 profit, okay? With the current CSD. All right, new way. If you had just hired a new CSD, 
there's always a ramp up time for every new person, but let's say you brought someone in who had done the exact job that you're looking for them to do. They've done the calls, they've done the ads, they're like, oh, I've done that like perfect person. Let's say you're paying them seven to 10 grand. Let's even say it's 10 grand. Let's go crazy, let's go bananas. Let's say three times what you're paying now. If you were to actually spend $10,000 on ads and you were able to take 160 calls, we don't even know if that would book out your calendar. Let's just say hypothetically, and you did 30,000 more dollars, that lets 30,000 plus another 30,000, cause that's your recurring. So say another 30,000, $60,000 a month, minus the same expenses, you're probably at like, give or take like 45K profit. You see what I mean? For the two months that you're sitting here training her, if you had just found someone who's more experienced, you could have just spent more on ads and made that up. And you would have someone who's ready to be a manager in the future. Now, you're learning. So I don't think that was a quote unquote bad decision, but I just wanted you to understand at this point in the game where I'm at, you always wanna hire for experience if you can. Because if you were like really low on margins and you were just starting, but your margins are so healthy that this to me is a very key hire and you wanna make sure that it's someone who can handle it. If she gets in there and then she can't handle it, guess what? And then you have to do it again, you're gonna lose even more money because what's you're stalled at, it's not, you won't think you're losing money. You're like, no, I didn't lose any money. Yeah, you did because what's happening is while you're doing this job, you can't spend more and you would have made more just by doing that. Does that at least logically make sense? That makes sense. Okay. But when I was finding, an, I did it too late. Mm -hmm. So finding a CSM, it was when things were really chaotic and mm -hmm. I just barely had any time to- I know, you didn't have time. Notes. I know, yeah, so, so that, and that's normal. I just wanna point that out to you that in the future, like, let me ask you this, how did you find her? Through Indeed, but that was like kind of my next question because yeah. I agree, I'd rather hire on experience, but I was trying to just hire quick. And I know, but like, what did you put for the salary? The salary? Yeah, what it, so 3,400 a month is not that much, I don't think. It's- In Canada, it's like, what, four grand? Uh, it's, roughly, it's okay, yeah, it's like probably yeah. a little four grand, Canadian, yeah. yeah. But what was your, what did you put for the job post? I have to check it, but it was, I put it in annual. Okay. So it's like anywhere from, it was a broad range, but- Yeah, what's like, the range? I think I said it was like, like 54 to 72 or 54 to 80 K Canadian annually. 54 to 72 Canadian? Yeah. Okay, then, then then that's not that bad. I But I would say that even, so if it's 72 Canadian, then that's probably more around the $6,000 a month mark, right? So all I'm saying is you'll attract better talent with higher pay, period. So all I'm saying is, I understand where you're at. It's very normal. I don't think this is bad. You're gonna learn from it either way. But in the future, what I'm just trying to get you to understand is a lot of times for certain key positions, especially client facing, I will pay more sales, client fulfillment. The only other positions I'll pay premium for is C-suite. So CMO, COO, CEO, stuff like that. But I just wanted you to see that in, from the standpoint, if this doesn't work out, then in the future, think of it more like this, because what people don't understand is that you're gonna make more by getting more sales calls on your plate. Like the funnel thing doesn't even matter. You get that, right? You can test that, but what you're doing is working. So you know what my advice is when stuff works? Don't change it because there's no reason to change it. Now, it's not optimal, but who cares? Until you run into another bottleneck, I don't change stuff, but you're in a good spot. So here's the thing. There's not much you can do until this is fixed. Once this is fixed, I jacked that ad spend way up until you're bleeding, you know, out of your ears from sales calls, you'll hit 100K because like your ROI will go down, but it won't matter because as you spend more, even if your cost of acquisition goes up, you're you're getting 750 per client. And is it a three month minimum? What's the contracts you have? I, or is it month to month? It's just month to month. Okay. So I had the last person who came in here said the same thing. So I'm not against month to month if that helps you make more sales because see what some people will say is, oh, don't do month to month. But then what might happen is you might not make the sale at all. But I guess what I'm curious about is what's your average LTV? So if you took all your clients by how many months they stay, what's the average LTV? Okay, so I'm not sure if this is fully accurate. It's okay. But the number that I calculated, and this is probably just because I had a lot of people when I first started signing clients uh -huh. on like trials. Yeah. So they either stuck with me. So you did, you did like the, was it like free for 30 days type thing? I did like a $300 test drive for okay. two weeks. What's the ad spend they have to spend minimum? What's their minimum ad spend? So this was last year, Okay. but I was only doing like 25 a day ad spend. Per client? Like, yeah, for their ads. Hardly anything, right? Yeah, now I make the minimum 40 to 50. So you you were doing 750 minimum, now it's 1500, right? Yeah. Okay, why um, is it so low on the minimums? Are they broke? Yeah. Cause you know, the more ad spend they spend, the higher chance they have a success, right? Yeah. So why not make it higher? You think they can't afford it? I think it'll create resistance because 
I mean, even when they hear... But less clients who pay more, it's the same thing. You realize that. So it, there, there's pros and cons to each, right? I think the cool thing about the business you're in, how many clients can your media buyer handle? I mean, he's doing pretty solid right now for 30. Is he overloaded or no? No, but I have him doing like onboarding stuff too. Meaning what? Like what is that? Is that his job? So he does media buying on the ads and I want to get someone separate just to like do GHL, tech, onboarding, mm -hmm. building out funnels. But right now he's doing that. And it's all okay. the copy and paste. Oh, so he doesn't do, does he do the funnels and stuff or no? I create them. He just like puts in the values and. Mm, okay. Yeah. So you're, yeah, you're doing a lot. But why can't the media buyer do the funnels? Aren't you using the same stuff for every client? You're doing the same funnel, same copy, same everything, right? No? That's the thing. If it's a different service we've never run ads before for, then I kind of- Give me an example of a different service. You mean a different industry? You mean facial versus Botox? Basically. Okay. So why don't you just make them run the same place? Can you do that? Well, do not everyone offers the same services. Mm. So that's the only thing I don't like about med spa. Got it. So it's like, is that just how the industry works in general? Everyone it does a little bit different depending on the med spa. Like what I'm saying is, what are the services every med spa runs that are make a lot of money? Is it Botox? I can't imagine a med spa that doesn't do Botox. Botox doesn't make them a lot of money. Really? What makes them a lot? I get people on who have like, we can run an intro offer for like a body contouring session and uh -huh. they can sell a two, $3,000 package. Mm -hmm. And then I help them sell the packages. Mm -hmm. Not everyone offers high ticket packages and that's the main issue. Or they will, but it's for like, Microneedling versus body contouring. So it's like a different service. Okay. But basically once you build out the service once, you don't have to build it out again because you just run the same play. Yeah. Right? So I, I don't know if you need to go hire someone for that because all I'm trying to get you to understand is let's say there's 30 services. At some point, all 30 of these will be built and you won't need someone to do that. Yeah. I don't think it's a massive issue. I think your issue is this. This is your issue for sure. This has to get off your plate tomorrow, like ASAP, because this is your bottleneck. As soon as that's done, everything else in your business doesn't really need to change yet. There's not. There's nothing to really change. Now, the only thing I would encourage you to try to do, and again, uh, that goes back to the question I asked you. What's your LTV? Do you know what your LTV is? Three months, four months, six months, 12, one. Yeah, so my average is super low. Okay. It's three, okay. but that's including a bunch of people who like, we're just on trials and didn't stick on past month. Okay, how do you bring everyone in? Is it a trial? No, so, okay, that was last year. So average call now, what, what happens? How much do I have to put down to start? I've upped it from 1500 to 1750. Okay, and you don't do any three month minimums. Have you tried doing three month minimums where you're on the phone and say, yeah, so it's 1750 a month, three month minimum, or no? I've closed a couple people on like a 5K PIF and they just split up the payments. That's really the only thing, but I don't do a ton of minimums. Have you tried it? Are you against it? I'm not against it. I think a lot of people have just been burned before. That's what I've heard, right? So I get that. So I guess my question is, why aren't they staying past three months typically? Because three months isn't terrible, but it's not great for sure. For MRR, that's not very good. Yeah. It'd be hard to sell your company too, because I'd go, well, what's your average client like three months? Now, if you're counting a bunch of free trials, don't count that. Count the people who actually paid money. That's yeah. what I want to know. How long for those people? Okay, so my longest client's LTV right now is 10 months. Okay. Just because that's when I started really signing clients. Okay. So it's going to be low just because... Like you haven't had enough. How long have you had the business? Roughly, a year? Two years? Roughly a year, but... Okay, so you haven't had it that long. Yeah. Okay. So you don't really know your LTV yet, to be honest. You don't have any, you, know, you don't even have a, you basically have a year of data. Yeah. So I don't have a ton of data. Okay. So, and do you have clients that who've signed up who are still with you since day one or no? Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. So let's just say you don't really know the LTV. The only reason I'm bringing that up is if you can get on a phone call and enforce a minimum, great. If you feel you can't, not a big deal. 1750 is fine. I don't think there's that big of a deal with it. The rule of thumb is your cost of acquisition has to be 25% of CAC. That made no that made literally no sense. Your <laughs> your LTV per customer should be 25%, should be uh 75% uh more than your CAC. Okay, and they were said it that way. So if you're doing 4500 excuse me, if you're doing 4500 you're saying you're getting 300 Okay, so 25% of that would be like 1200. So you're good. So yeah. the rule of thumb I, I have for clients is I say spend until your cost of acquisition is 1200, then you can stop ads. So what a lot of people will do is they'll freak out that this number is going up, but as long as it stays under 1200, you're gonna be insanely profitable. Does that make sense? You'll also probably be better off when you have someone in here who's doing that all day. Cause right now it's actually hilarious. Your bottleneck is you can't take more clients. You can handle more clients if you get that off. The bottleneck is you. You're the bottleneck.
Yeah. But you're doing great. I mean, this is a great problem to have. You really, basically, you can make more money the second you spend more on ads. The second you spend more on ads, you'll make more money. There's nothing to really fix. I can look at your follow-up systems. I can tell you certain things you can increase. You definitely should be doing manager meetings up here. There's little things, but if you just look at the numbers of the business and you said, Tanner, you have 30 days to make this business make more money, I would come in your business, I would turn the ad spend up as high as I could and I would take all the calls for you. And then I'd just tell you, hey, give a really good service. Yeah. If we had to do it in 30 days. So you're in a great spot. What questions do you have or where do you want to go with the conversation? Because you're actually in a very good position. I'm really impressed. I mean, that's kind of the thing. Like January, February, mm -hmm. I think I hired a CSM way too late. Mm -hmm. You did, for sure. You should have hired them at 15000 a month, 20000 max. Yeah. You're a little late, for sure. Yeah. It's okay. You're learning. And I think that it was just very chaotic. Mm-hmm. And like overwhelming. So I, I would be on sales calls and almost not really want to close. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you because you know you have to deal with it. Yeah, that's yeah. not, it's not fun, is it? It's not. No. Yeah, that's why I'm still, I know I can scale up ads. I'm only spending 2200 You can't months. scale up, you, you can't, you can't scale up until that's fixed. In fact, if you want, you could turn your ads off. I don't know if I'd recommend that, but you could turn them down until that's fixed because that's your bottleneck. There's not much else you can do until that's taken care of. And so another thing you could do, you're not spending that much time on calls, but if you wanted, if you turn it all the way down, you took no calls, then that's more time you can work with the CSM. Mm -hmm. And maybe you get that done faster. My biggest concern, right now is just that this is the right person for the job. If you feel she is, great. If you don't, you're gonna waste more time and lose more money trying to make, you know, a circle fit in a square. Don't do that. What questions do you have? Did you say something maybe about hiring or what can we cover? Cause I think overall you're doing good. You're doing very well. I mean, I was gonna say that my sales kind of went down this month, just how many calls I'm getting, but it's probably cause I switched. I haven't refreshed creatives in like two months. So I think that's, that's fine. It doesn't matter. Like, think about it. Why do you think that matters? It doesn't matter. Why does you refreshing your creatives matter? You're at a 5X ROAS. What do you think your ROAS should be? I think that's good. I just, like, I don't know. I didn't close anyone this week, so. So what? What's your, think about it. Like, there's order of operations in every yeah. business. What is your actual biggest problem? You tell me, like, what do you think it is? I think it's just fulfillment. Yeah, so think about it this way. It doesn't really matter if you close new people because even your numbers are good. You're going, well, Tanner, I didn't close anyone this week. Okay, but you're spending two grand a month. It's a lot of averages. It doesn't matter what you close in a week. It matters what you close in a month. So if you're only spending two grand a month, that means you're only getting what? Two or three clients a month? Or how many clients are you getting a month? Past few months have been like seven, eight. Okay, so you are getting a decent, so you're getting a couple a week. How long have you been running ads? Since June, but they've been on and off. Okay, so think of it this way, it's a lot of averages. So last month, for example, in the second day of the month, my sales team collected grand on a certain offer. This month, it took them halfway through the month to collect that same amount of money. So we were, so last month we were ahead for the first half of the month and then it, the averages caught up. This month, it was the opposite. We were behind all month and then we caught up halfway through. So something you have to trust is it's gonna even out. If you've already closed as many deals as you have, I don't think it's an issue in your sales ability. It may just be you had a bad week or you didn't get the best leads. And then next week you might close double the clients you usually do. You don't know. Regardless, that's still down on your totem pole because when you look at the numbers, your bottleneck is you can't spend more because you can't take any more calls. Why? Because you're too much in fulfillment. So my guess is that if you spent more and took more calls, you'd close more and you have more energy because you're not so stressed out with this. So is that really an issue? Not really. I mean, it is, but it's down the list. So we can talk about your sales if you want, but your biggest bottleneck is instantly when you get that rollout, your business will immediately go up because you'll spend more, you'll take more calls and you'll make more sales. Yeah. One of the things just longer term plays mm -hmm. that I really, really want to do because there are a few med spa services that we fulfill on really, really well. Mm -hmm. And I want to productize my service just to more around that sub niche. So even Meaning like, what? Like explain a little better. Most of my clients who are doing the best and who have been with me the longest have one specific service that mm -hmm. we advertise for. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what my branding on like my page is around too. So I want to sub niche, like I want to niche the niche. And to do that, because Metspa is already small and you're going after like a smaller niche within a niche, mm -hmm. I want to go after franchises or partnerships. Like you're saying Metspa is that offer a specific service, you just go after that? Yeah. Okay, and then you are you want to do what? Go ahead, franchises you said? I want to try to go after franchises and like the machine becoming partnered with the machine, which other companies Right, do. because then you, all of their same locations can do it and you can run it for all their locations, yeah. Yeah, okay. and our fulfillment is really, really dialed in for that service. Mm -hmm. like it's really good. Mm -hmm. But how do I go about 
like those bigger plays? I mean, if you were trying to go after a franchise, I think it would be some type of trial period where you're gonna have to do some type of cold email or cold call. They're not gonna click on your ads, right? Mm -hmm. So you'd have to do some type of cold email or cold call, which I know you've learned, and then do some type of trial. And if it works, they could roll it out. But that's a big ask, right? Because you're asking them to trust you. That's like going to McDonald's and you're like, hey, I wanna roll out this new burger. So you have to really wow them, but that would be the way you do it. There's no way to do that with paid traffic. You're not gonna get the owner of, I don't know any big med spas, but even a guy like me, it's hard to get a guy like me to click on an ad. I'm not gonna do it. So it's really if you can get connected to the owners of those, but it's just gonna be through cold emails or DMs. I think it's a great idea. I just wouldn't do it yet. There's no reason to do that, I don't think, until you can easily hit 100K a month with what you have right now. Because if you start focusing on that, you're taking your eye off the golden goose. This is your golden goose right now. I wouldn't start doing that until once you get to 100K a month, you can setters doing stuff for you, you can get a sales rep, and then you can start being the strategy, the visionary for the business. But I don't think you're there until you're at 100K at least. Do you think it's a good idea to at least call out that sub niche in my ads because yeah okay. if you can get it if you're having so much success with your ads why not split test that sub niche i would what's the worst thing that can happen your roas is 5x i mean boohoo you know it's not that bad yeah it's a good problem to have yeah so i've been playing around with doing that and i think it is kind of attracting the right people uh -huh. it's just that that sub niche is also very broke so well, that's not good that's a terrible sub niche though. What was the sub niche? Are you able to tell me or no? Yeah, it's a specific body contouring device, okay. basically. Okay. So a lot of people who have that device are kind of just like solopreneurs, solo owners, mm. not like a full blown med spa. So there's a lot of potential to help them. But can they afford the service? But it's tough for them to afford the service. It's not a good niche though. It's like saying, yeah, I got this thing for 18 year olds. It's gonna change their life, cool. Do they have money? No, but do you understand? So the only issue is if you can figure out a way to get them financing or, you know, I don't know, like for me, $17.50 a month, I don't think that's a, that expensive personally. I think it's pretty cheap. If they can't even afford that, that's not a good niche. $17.50 to me, is, I mean, you're broke as a joke. That's bare bones. Yeah. Oh, the other thing is, even if we're getting them clients and we're doing our part, they still need to be able to sell the packages, which we help with. But that's another thing, like clients churn either because maybe we're not bringing them enough clients, which doesn't happen that often. Mm -hmm. But, but that's also why your CSM has to be super good because they're basically they're a sales coach. Your CSM yeah. is a sales coach. Yeah. You, in fact, you probably should look for a sales coach. Yeah. If you're going after a solopreneur who's never made money with it, it's not a good avatar because they've never done it. Yeah. So part of the issues I'm having with what you're saying is, hey, this is a really good sub niche where they need a lot of help, but they don't have any money and they may not have sales skills. Yeah, good luck. I mean, unless you're gonna do it for them. Yeah. But then when you start doing everything for them, you're basically running their business and that's not worth your time because mm -hmm. you're running your business and your business makes more money than theirs does. So I love your ideas. I think you seem very bright. You seem super smart. You're 21, that's crazy. That's why I asked, you seem very young. It's, I mean, you're doing better than most grown men, that's great. I just, I think you need to stay focused. You have something good here. I wouldn't like deviate. It's what you're doing already is working. You seem like a little worried about it. Why? Like, what are you worried about? I just really like that sub niche because I, mm -hmm. I have really good confidence on those calls because mm -hmm. I know we can fulfill really well. So um, what's the issue on the call typically? They say they can't afford it. Um, is it the same price, seventeen fifty a month, seven fifty of ad spend or fifteen hundred of ad spend a month? So just because they are like struggling a lot of the time, their credit cards fail on the ads or on the monthly retainers and then they're not they don't can't afford to get their reps in. But I've also had some like some of those people who offer that service are also my people with the highest 10 month LTV. So I think it's just a okay. matter of getting the So, right. okay, so back up. What's the difference between the 10 month LTV people and the people whose credit cards decline in the same sub niche? What's the difference? Think about it. What is it? They're better at selling. Okay, so meaning they have prior sales experience in any type of industry or in this specific industry? In like this specifically. Okay, what else? And we just get them enough clients for them to at least close a few packages a month. Right, so then enough ad spend. Okay, yes. so when you market, what do you say? Hey, I can help people who in this niche who have two things. One, must have prior sales experience. Two, must be able to spend $5,000 in three months on ads or whatever. If they get on the call and they can't do it, don't close them. Like you're creating your own problem. Yeah. Do you understand? Yeah. So guess what will happen? As you push those people away and you only get the best clients, guess what? Oh my gosh, the fulfillment's so easy. This is so great. Instead of, guess what those clients do? 
whine, moan, complain, you suck, I hate, like those are the worst clients. So you answered your own question. All you're gonna do is you're gonna run your marketing like that and then if you get on the sales call, ask them right at the beginning, hey, just so you know, like I'm gonna go through this service, like are you able to do that? If they're not, you say, hey, this won't work for you, I'm sorry. That's it? Yeah, that makes sense. Cause there are a couple other big agencies mm -hmm. in that sub niche who do really well, but they mm -hmm. just go after the bigger clients. Yes, it all comes down to focusing on the top 20%. Okay? Yeah. So look, here's your clients. You got all these and then all your marketing and focus should be on these clients, or excuse me, that's the 20%. It's this top 20%. That's what you wanna focus on. So if you look at your best clients, what are the things they have and then sell to those people, talk to those people, all even your marketing, right? If I was talking to someone like you, I'm gonna talk completely different than someone like him, right? He's seven feet tall and a dude. <laughs> You know, and you're not seven feet tall and a girl. So like, think of it that way. And then your marketing and those things will attract more of those people. And then when you're on the sales call, don't close those people. Now your cost of acquisition might go up, but guess what? If you're getting a 10 month LTV, who cares? Cause it's the long term, right? It's the long term picture. Yeah. Cause I was thinking even if my monthly retainer isn't like as high as other agencies, like 2,500 or three grand, if I have a longer LTV, or just a longer retention, that's gonna be better from a And it's easier to fulfill because think about it. Yeah. You're not gonna get headaches. You know who the clients give you the headaches? The bottom 80%. Those give you all the headaches. The best clients is where you want your focus because they're the easiest clients to get results for, they complain the least, etc. Yeah. On that note though, uh -huh. how do you, so, okay, I feel like acquisition sometimes is kind of a race to the bottom, like with the offers, the crazy guarantees. It is, because so, you're attracting, you're attracting scum, you know? Yeah. How do you run a good offer that doesn't attract those types of cheap clients, but it's not a race to the bottom. Well, everyone is. I think you figured it out. You're getting a 5X ROAS. You seem so concerned with your sales. Your sales are great. What, what, what are you so worried about? Yeah. No, but seriously, like you, you are, like, what, what are you worried about? You obviously have a worry. I'm, gen I'm curious, like, what are you so worried about? Why do you think what you're doing isn't working? I think it's working. I don't know. Maybe I'm just in the mindset of like, it's working until it doesn't. I mean, the thing with SMMA is if you can retain the clients, it doesn't always have to work. That's the cool part. Yeah. It doesn't always have to work. I guess to answer your question better, the best offer is an offer where you can guarantee the results. Those are the best offers. If you can't control that, then it goes back to the formula. So, I mean, it's just the formula here. What's the best offer? You have the goal, basically, determined outcome. You have the risk, you have time, and you have effort. Here's what's great about your offer. You're taking a lot of their time and effort away, which is great. That's why it's a good offer. Your risk is pretty low too, because they only have to pay month to month and they pretty much want the goal, right? They want to make more money. So to answer your question, what could you do to make it better? There's nothing you can do to make it a more attractive offer. What you could do though, is instead of having, yeah, you get free refunds and you get free time and all this stuff is you just make a stronger offer where you go after the best customers and the best clients and you talk to them. I have a client we were talking about this earlier. He does a fitness offer. His whole ad is, this is for men who make at least 150K a year. If you don't make 150K a year, this isn't for you because it's super expensive. I mean, he just goes right after them. But he has a he has a money back guarantee, but it's a conditional. So conditional, technically conditional is you're actually playing a game. So let me, I'll make you a conditional offer. So Selena, it's $50,000 to work with me, but you can get a full refund if you don't hit 20,000 a month in the next 90 days. So that's what they'll say in their marketing, but on the backside, there's conditions. So for example, Selena, you have to get on one call with me a week. You have to send hundred messages a day. You have to show up to six group coaching calls. You can do that where you can market it, but you don't say all the conditions in the marketing. You would talk about it more on the sales call. You're not gonna say it's an ad. Hey, if you do this, you get your money back. If you do, duh, 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 that would be a weird ad. It's weird. So you only usually hear that part, but you have a good offer. The only thing different you can do is if you don't like the type of people you're attracting, you talk to the higher level people, which means you're gonna have a higher cost of application. You're gonna have a lower CTR, but you might have a better client. So remember, you have averages and KPIs, key performance indicators, so you know if you're at least on the right track. But I would argue this, for example, <clears throat> here's your numbers right now. You said it was $30 in application, it was 2K ad spend, and then you said about what, 350 cost of acquisition, right? Yeah. Okay, right now, let's say on average, you have a three month LTV. So here's my argument to you. What if you spent 2K and you got 10 apps and your cost of acquisition was 900, but then your LTV was eight months? This is actually better than this. You get what I'm saying? So I think what you're 
hoping for is, hey Tanner, how can I get better clients so I'm not on a race to the bottom? You do that, but you'd have to be okay with your numbers changing. And if you're not, and that messes with your mind, you won't be okay with it. It's okay to have higher numbers if you get better clients. Does that make sense? Or clients who pay more. And in your case, who's a client who pays more? It's the client who stays longer. That's the best client. Yeah, because I think what's driving my LTV down is if they're a person that I shouldn't have maybe signed. You know, right. So, you so what you, it. so what you, but, but here, there's a, there's two sides of the coin. It's okay to sign a client who maybe isn't optimal because you still have to run the business and pay expenses. So you can't just turn everyone away, yeah. but turn away the worst clients. So, for example, you'll have clients who, you know, cancel after one month and then you have clients at 10 months. I'm not saying cancel these calls or don't let them in, just cancel this one or like the two, the one month, you know, the zero and the one month. Or you create different tiers. I don't think you're ready for that. But for example, in my program, we have Elite Launch Academy. That's a dollar program for beginner beginners. So when you started your business, that was you, okay? Where you're at now, we have Mastermind. That's a thousand dollar offer. You're more acute for that. You have some skill, da, da, da. And then we have what's called next level. That's building your team. You're actually about to get into that level where you're starting to build. So that's your other option. I, but I, I think you're trying to fix things that aren't happening. I, I love it because it shows you're intelligent. I understand why you think that way because I think the same way. You're, you're trying to be proactive, but you're trying to solve for issues you don't have yet. All that stuff, I wouldn't worry about it yet because it's not really a problem. Your issue, you can have the best clients in the world. You know what your problem is? You're working too much and it doesn't matter. You you just can't do it. So even if you kept getting bad clients, if someone else is dealing with it, it's not really a problem, right? But I think the biggest thing you would just need to do is change your marketing. Talk more to the best clients and you can pull it. Look at your best clients. What do the top clients do? And then you start talking about that and make conditions. So at what point do you switch from the mindset of just like move as fast as you can to, okay, let's think more strategically, mm -hmm. go slower, but move smarter. I usually say 100K because mm -hmm. let's just be honest. Why did you start the business? Just an alternative route to what I was doing. Right, but why? Why is this route better? What's the upside? Time freedom, location freedom. You can be your own boss. Yeah, you make more. You make more money. Right, so, so really at the end of the day, why do we all start businesses? Because we're going to make more, right? Mm -hmm. You wouldn't do this if you made less, would you? No. No. So usually to me, the number is 100K because once you get to 100, you have a big enough team that you're now just managing and you're not in the day-to-day -day operations. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Is the ultimate goal that you're off the phone and you're out of fulfillment? Yeah. Okay, so there's two options. Here's your options. So you either hit 100K a month so you can get a full-time 10% commission sales rep. That's one option. Option two is you're anywhere between 50 to 100K a month where you are right now, or even 30. We'll just say right now. You could do this right now. You bring them on and they're a setter. So remember, if they're gonna be a closer, they're gonna have to be a little better than a typical setter. They can't just do uh, that. So typically they're gonna have to make between two to 4K as a setter. I'd say usually 3K. And then if you're at 50K a month or 40K a month, they're making 10% from that. So they're gonna make total, you know, seven to 8K doing a hybrid. Right, so they're doing a hybrid position. Does that make sense? That's your only two options if you want that. The reason I like this is why they're gonna be more skilled usually and they're focusing on one thing. This is it's kind of what you're doing with your CSM, where she could probably do it, but you're like, yeah, I mean, she's got for them, but I don't know, but she's good enough. What ends up happening more times than not is when you do stuff like this instead of that, is you end up wasting more time. Now, your other option is you just pay more. You can say, hey, I'll give you 20%, but what you'll have to be okay with your lowering your profit margin. You're overpaying is what I'm saying. You could pay 15 to 20%, but you're way overpaying if you do that. But that might be worth it to you. Maybe for you, you think, hey, if I can take home, you know, 30 grand a month and I don't have to work, cool, great. But would 10% even make sense for something that's not super high ticket, like 1750? Yeah, month? because he gets all the recurring. He gets 10% of collected. 10% of collected and recurring? That's how you make it worth it. Because that's still fair, think about it. If you collected 30 grand this month, he gets 10% every month on what they pay. So it'll take a while to build up, but think about 1750 is not very attractive. Oh my God. $175. Like yeah. that's not attractive, but if it, if you let him get it every month, that's how you'll keep them. And that's how you want to do it. Because then he's going to be super incentivized to sell them. He's also going to be incentivized to sell good clients because he knows the longer they stay, the more he gets paid. So it'll work. You just have to be willing to do that. And the way you would do is you'd have a sell sheet. We could hook you up with one of our sell sheets where we set it up and we do it in a way where if a client defaults, we just put something in a sell and it blocks out their recurring revenue so we don't have to recalculate every month. Okay. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Okay.
I think it's just right now, I feel kind of stuck because it's like, I can spend more on ads, but I You're just not stuck. don't have. All you need to do is you get the CSM in. Keep your ads where it is. I want you to know, I think you might not know my story. So I was at zero. I was sending 200 messages a day doing cold DMs. I got up to 50,000 a month and I was super burnout. I was managing the setters, taking the sales calls. I was doing everything. And so what I did when I was where you were at, I was like, oh man, I gotta get a coach. I have to get someone in here. So you know what I did? I turned my ad spend down, had a little relief. We went from 50,000 to $30,000 a month, got the coach in there. And then when the coach came in there, I turned it back up. You're not stuck. It has to be done. So your only option is you keep spending the little amount you have and you're, you just work 12 hours, what you're doing. Or if you're stressed, turn it down a little bit. You're gonna make a little less money for one to two months and you know you're gonna turn it back up. You're not stuck though. What you're doing is every business owner who's ever had a business has felt what you're feeling right now. You think it just magically is happening to you? I went through the same thing. You can't be everywhere. So that's why you build a team. So what you're feeling is stretched. You're feeling stretched because you need help. You're in a perfect position. If I was giving you steps, here's what I would do. One, get the CSM in place. Two, once the CSM is in place, up your ad spend as much as you're comfortable with. That doesn't mean you have to go to 10K the next month, but when she realistically can handle it with just you managing, managing would mean 30 minute call a day, right? You're just, hey, this and that, or you're helping. You wanna up ad spend as much as you can. I think if you do that, I will be shocked if you can't hit 100K within 60 days, if you go aggressive. Now, if you don't go aggressive, aggressive would mean you go up to like $10,000 on spend. If you don't do that, then just you make this longer. Maybe it takes you 120 days because you go from 2K to 4K and then 4K to 6. You're not stuck. You're in a perfect position. You can't handle more leads. That's the best problem in business. I'd love to have your problem. Yeah. It's the best problem because you you have so many leads, you can't handle the volume. That's amazing. So you're in a perfect spot. I just want you to know you're not, I don't want you to think something's wrong with you. Nothing's wrong with you. Every person who's had a business that's successful has felt this at some point. It's normal. And then guess what will happen later? You're going to feel it again. And your CSM's going to go, oh my gosh, I can't handle the clients. So you have to hire someone new. It, it just happens over and over. So business, to just see it on a visual level, this is business. You're at zero, you scale. You can't handle any more clients. You go down a little bit because you're paying more payroll and you're hiring and you're training so you're not making as many sales and you're having to pay. That's what sucks right now is you're paying her and doing her job. That's the worst part, but that's how it works. And then when she's ready, you're gonna scale again and then you're gonna get up to 100K or whatever it is and you're gonna go down again and then you scale. This is how actual businesses work. It doesn't go like this, that's, that's bullshit. It's like a jagged line. And then sometimes if it's really fun, it goes like this. And then COVID happens and it goes like this. And then, it, you know, and then like it, and it's not, it's not this like straight line. Yeah. I definitely put off hiring a CSM because there wasn't like a big urgency mm -hmm. when I should have hired her. But I was also just maybe scared of my overhead going up and then like that pressure. But I think it's a good thing. But how do you, maybe from a mindset perspective, do that risk assessment? So why didn't you hire one sooner? I'd say, okay, I probably should have hired one when mm -hmm. I was about 20 clients, mm -hmm. 15, 20K, but I wasn't spending a lot on ads. It was- Yeah, and you were worried that it might go down. Yeah. I think you did it perfectly. I did it the same way you did. You've waited until you're so stretched, you can't be stretched anymore. I like it that way because no matter what happens, you know you need help now. So there's two ways to hire, and you explain the way I prefer to hire. Here's your bottleneck here. And you go until you're literally here and then you hire. Here's what other people do. People go like this. They come here and they see the bottleneck coming and they try to time it. But what the issue is with timing it is sometimes they get to here and then they just stay right here. And now their profit goes down forever. Or they get here and they do it too soon and then it takes them months and months and months and then they go up. So it just depends what you care about. If you care more about being stress-free and your time, you might do this. If you're like me, which you might be, and you're super profit-driven, you wait till the last second. Neither way is wrong. You just did what I did. I don't think what you're doing is wrong. You're in a great position. You're holding all the cards. So you would get your CSM ramped up mm -hmm. and then ramp up ads. Yep, but when I say this, make sure she can handle it because what's gonna happen is as soon as you jack this up, you're gonna feel pressure here. She's gonna start feeling pressure because what I think will happen is if you up your ad spend to 10,000, you're going to go from 30 to 40 and you're going to go, you're going to blow by a hundred. I don't see how you won't. The only thing is my appointment setters, cause I only have three right now. Mm -hmm. And 
they can barely manage like 30 accounts. Yeah, so then you would get her and then you should be looking for an appointment setter right now. Get a job post, put it out for an appointment setter while you're training her. And you just have to start being more proactive because remember, you're the, you're the manager and what's gonna happen as that goes up, you're gonna need more appointment setters. Guess what else you're gonna need? Another media buyer. So what you do is you proactively see that coming and you just start getting job posts out and give yourself time. Just so you know, there's some jobs that take me six months to hire. Some take me a year if I want them to be good. What you're trying to avoid is not just hiring hiring anyone who has a pulse because that's what's going to hurt you. You want good talent. You want good people. The good thing is you're, you foresee problems. So just prepare, put a job post out now. Don't wait until three seconds. Oh my gosh, we just got seven new clients. We can't handle it. Oh, what? Are, and then you freak, you stress yourself out. Yeah. Start being proactive. But this first hire you've done with the CSM, you're fine. I think you've done a great job. You're 78% profit margin. That's crazy. Some businesses can't even do 10%. Yeah. That's reassuring just because yeah. I didn't know if I was making a good decision, kind of not scaling ads right now. You are making a good decision. You can't. Okay. What are you going to do? Do you not have to sleep? Is there something I should know? You just stay awake all day? You just sit in bed and like, you can't wait for the sun to come up so other people are awake. You got to yeah. sleep. So you're good, but this is a great problem to have. What's fun is that you're in full control. As soon as that CSM's done, you can up the ad spend, you can hire new setters, you take more sales calls, you're going to, it's fun. That's, but this is business. There's always a problem to solve. You're just managing problems all the time. You're never not gonna have problems. In fact, the bigger my businesses get, I get more problems. I just get better at dealing with them. Yeah, okay. 100K a month is about where you need to get. If you wanna have a good team that you can pay good money that isn't gonna leave and you can take time off. To get to 100K a month, you're gonna need nine setters. Out of this, you're gonna need two managers. So you're gonna need your top setters who can manage, or, or one, you're gonna need one or two managers, depending, probably one's fine. So you're gonna need one manager, and then your CSM, you're gonna need probably one CSM, and then you're gonna have two coaches here. So coach, coach, and then you're gonna have one sales rep. That's when you'll feel freedom, because look, CSM is managing them. You're just managing her. You manage the manager, the manager manages the setters. And then here, you're just managing one sales rep. But that's easy because it's only one person. So now it's like, ah, oh, I don't have to do anything today if I don't want to. That's why I think you should shoot there because otherwise you can make less. You could get to maybe 60,000 a month. And instead of nine setters, you have, let's say six and you'd have one manager, so that's fine. Here, you might have one, you don't have two coaches, but you're still either gonna have to take the sales calls or you're gonna have to find a hybrid or you're gonna have to overpay. You could do that too. Like, but for example, if you were paying 20%, 20%, they'd be making 12,000 a month, but you might be okay with that because you're not paying anything here. I don't want you stressed out. If you are okay overpaying a sales rep, just pay them a higher percentage and then you're good. Because here, if you're doing six setters, I think, what did you say you're paying a setter? About 600 to 800. Okay, so let's say 800 times six, so 48. Okay, so 4,800, okay. Your coach, let's say you have two coaches, so you're paying, let's just say 10K. Let's let's go over, let's be aggressive. So 10K, let's say for ads, you're gonna do another 7K. Let's go aggressive. So you're at 17 plus five, so you're 23. You pay 12. Let's say you overpay the sales rep, so you do 20%. 23 plus 12 is 35. You would still be taking home 25K a month. It just depends what your goal is. For me, I really like 100K because I'm not overpaying. The only way that you're gonna do it for less is you're gonna overpay or you're gonna have to manage more. So think of it this way. What a lot of people do is they'll hire an employee and go, oh my gosh, once I hire them, I won't have to do it. But because the employee's not that skilled, you're spending more time babysitting than if you just hired someone better. You get that? Think if you had to mow the lawn and you hired a five-year-old versus me. So I'm 200 bucks, but the five-year-old charges you an ice cream cone. You're like, oh my gosh, the five-year-old, but the five-year-old can't even, you know, see over the top like this. And you're, you get what I'm saying? That's, that's the analogy. So usually it's better to pay a little more because then you don't have to be involved versus you pay a little less and then you're always involved. You're always having to stay on top of stuff. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, you're spending two grand, you're making a five X row ass and you're, you said this month you might hit 40 to 50 K. There's no way if you spent 10 grand, you wouldn't be over hundred grand. There's no way. I don't see it. It's impossible. I don't know anyone I've talked to who's spending 2,000 a month who's hitting 40,000 collected. That's crazy. Why do you think it'll be so hard to hit 100? It won't, it shouldn't. Yeah, another reason why I put up the CSM is because I think churn is gonna go up if I'm not maybe in the CS position. Yeah, well, a little bit. 80% as good as you is the rule. So mm -hmm. if you can hire someone who can do 80% as good as you, great. Or you gotta pay premium. You gotta pay a lot more. So for me, if I was you and I could go back in time and let's say you hadn't hired the CSM yet, I might double what I pay. I might, hey, I'll pay seven or eight grand a month. So you're gonna get a really good person. Yeah. You know?
Where would you find those really good people? We like LinkedIn. Indeed's good too, but we always get shut down on Indeed. They always say I'm an MLM company. I got uh, shut down. Yeah, I don't, I don't really understand why they think uh, I'm MLM, but yeah. So we use LinkedIn. I like it a lot. So yeah, we'll just do a job post on LinkedIn. We, we actually pay LinkedIn uh, annual fee and they let us have five job posts up at a time and we just run them all the time. Because when your company gets bigger, you're, you're always recruiting for your company in mm -hmm. case someone leaves or quits, et cetera. Indeed's good, but they always shut us down. But in Indeed's great. I use a type form to vet, so you could use the GHL form where they fill, I mean, some positions, I have to filter so many people. We'll get hundreds of applications. And so I use a type form that will automatically disqualify them if they don't fit certain criteria, so I don't have to waste my time. That's the other thing is if you know that's coming, I would have a job post out for setters. You're gonna need another coach at some point. You don't need it now, uh, but the setters is gonna be your next thing. You're gonna have to start hiring more setters. Just make sure when you're hiring, do they fit your culture? So do they have the right attitude? Will they work hard? Will they show up on time? That type of stuff. And then do they have experience? Prior experience is so helpful because think about it. If you worked for me and you did sales for me for three years, the next person, they get all that experience. That's just hard to buy. No matter how good a teacher you are, it's just hard to buy experience or teach experience, I guess. Yeah, that's helpful. Yeah. I guess just in general though too, given that like, let's say you're new to business yeah. and you're just scaling and you're figuring it out mm -hmm. as you go, mm -hmm. what are your biggest mindset tips? And like what regard? Like what do you what do you think about sometimes? I think like how, how sustainable is this long term? Because I do want to eventually exit and sell it. Mm -hmm. And it's like, what about the next thing? Like when when's the time to start thinking about what other stuff? That's a great there? question. So for me, if you've watched any of my videos, I say that most companies max out around one to two million a month or in this industry, internet marketing. Some will get the three million. SMMA usually is a little sooner because you're doing local locations, brick and mortar. I guess the question is, you just have to look at what your end goal is. What I like about what you're doing right now is you're learning a lot of skills. You're learning how to hire, how to train. So there's two types of entrepreneurs. You have venture capital, which is essentially, just think of your dad giving you a loan, venture capital really bright entrepreneurs in terms of ideas, terrible in execution. They don't know how to hire. They don't know how, like all the stuff you're doing right now, that's what people get paid the most for operations. That's that person. The other one is the operator, which is more internet marketing world where the businesses aren't as good. Usually they're not deemed as good. Like SMMA is never going to get venture capital. They don't like those businesses, but you're going to learn how to run a company. So I think it's two things. One is if your goal is to sell the company, then you have to be pretty much completely out, which means you have to have a sales guy who takes the calls. You have to have appointment setters who do that and you have to have managers for them. So that's why hundred K is also a good number because it gets high enough that you're you're making a lot of profit, which is why someone would buy it. You have good LTV, you have good recurring revenue, you know, et cetera, right? But you could sell it at any number. It's just to sell a company, you have to be uninvolved. It has to work without you. So if you disappeared for two weeks, how well would the company run? I think in your position, you can learn a lot. So whatever you do next later on in life, you're gonna have all the skills to operate. So that's one way to look at it, is just learn as much as you can right now. Number two then is, if you don't wanna do this forever, then you just need to decide what's that number you wanna hit and then sell it and be done. So what I think you should do is, you focus right now on learning everything you can. Maybe you do this for another two years, or what, you just set the, you set the mark, it's your life. You go, I'm gonna do this for the next two years, I'm gonna go as hard as I can or whatever. You try to set the number you wanna sell it at, so you can figure out pretty much what does SMA get on multiples? Do you know the 2X, 3X? Three, I think, is usual, but like three to five. So if you wanted to sell it, hypothetically, let's say you get it to 100000 a month and it's doing 50% profit. So it's doing 600000 a year. You would sell it for close to $2 million. If that's the number you're happy with, shoot for that and then go for it. The, the thing is, is that you'll know when the bottleneck is. Meaning when we got to $2 million, we just saw that no matter how much more we spent, no matter what adjustments we made, it just didn't really matter. You have a lot of room for growth because you're spending two grand and you're at a 5X ROI. So until that number breaks, just spend until it breaks. Once it breaks, you optimize. And then there comes a point where, let's say you optimize month after month after month after month and you can't break it. And then you hire a coach and they can't figure out. You'll kind of know that's about as high as you're going to get in that industry. And then you'll know, okay, I can either sell it or I can keep collecting the cash. That's what happened with elite CEOs for me. Not every company will scale forever. There's bottlenecks depending on the offer of the business. Yeah. And I think you said it, like learning the skills is really important. Yeah. Like think of how much you're 21. You've already hired three setters. You've hired a coach or excuse me, a media buyer. You hired a coach. You're running ads. You're making sales calls. 
you're perfect. I could hire you for a million things. You're super valuable because you have a lot of skills. This is your schooling right now. So instead of going to college, or are you in college? You're not in college? I just graduated. Oh, dude, that even, that's even f Yeah, like you're you're the golden child. So you, you finish college, you graduate, you start the business, it's crushing, you're doing everything great. So everything you're learning now is an education and it's gonna help you for the next thing. So sometimes I think what happens as we start having success, we, we're like, okay, so how do I get out of this? What's next? But what you gotta understand is this right now is gonna help you with the next thing. So what you're doing is you're making yourself more valuable as well. So when you go to the next thing, you'll have the skills to do it. You'll bring more value. You'll have more opportunity. I hear what you're saying. This is not gonna be the only thing you do for your life. But for now, I think you could spend the next one to two years or more really building this company and learn so much. And then when you're done with it, sell it and go to your next thing, 100%. Yeah. And you have a better business model to sell than mine. Yeah. I think it was just maybe like a fear thing because I was like, nobody really does SMA for like 10 years. Yeah. So are you more scared about you don't know what to do next or you don't see a way out or what are you scared about? I think it's just me overthinking, but... That's what happens when you're smart, unfortunately. The cool thing is because you're so smart, look at everything you've accomplished. The downside is you might overthink things, but it's okay, I do too. Even though I'm not that smart, but I still can relate sometimes. <laughs> but what I would focus on, if you were my sister, for example, what I would say is where you're at now, you're perfect. Learn everything you can, squeeze all the juice out of this, like hire, train, manage, like try to grow this business as big as you can, sell it, and then take those skills into the next thing. Cause you're right, there's there's way bigger opportunities out there. Every person I talk to, they don't know how to run ads. They don't know how to run funnels. They don't know how to build a team. They have right. there's so many skills they're missing. And guess who they want? They want me. I had a guy who is working in a real estate portfolio. Three of the guys are gonna be billionaires. One of the guys is 32. He's gonna be a billionaire with a B. They want me to help run their stuff. And I'm like, really? You know, I'm thinking, me? Because I, I knew him very well, but billion, that's a big number. But they don't know how to do it because they played a different game. They're in a different kind of niche of business, if that makes sense. So anyways, I, I think you're in a great spot. Use it as an education. And then when you're done, be done. And you can set the goal. Say, I'm going to do this for the next two years. And whatever happens, happens. Or you say, I'm going to grow this until it's at 100K. Or I'm going to grow this until it's at 60K. It's your life. You can choose. Yeah. I guess I just want to figure out how to stack the skills mm -hmm. and enough cash where I can like set myself up for like for life, whether it's skill wise or being able to. Yeah. Start well, okay. So, the so thing. the goal I shoot for, how much do you want to live off per year? Like, do you want a super lavish one to 2 million a year or, you know, 50 K like hundred K a year, 200 K a year. What's the number for you? I haven't really thought about that. Okay. Well, you should. Cause you're saying yeah. I want to set myself up for life. I mean, technically you could be set up for life on a very small amount of money. Here's my rule of thumb. All the money I've made, I put in very safe investments. What I go off is 10% a year. So meaning if I want to live off a million a year, I need at least $10 million in investments. If I want to live off 200,000 a year, I need at least $2 million in investments because you're going to make 10% typically. Some people may disagree with that number, et cetera. But if your goal is, hey, I could live off 200,000 a year, then 2 million should be the goal. If you get it to $100,000 plus, you could sell it if it's at a 3X, because it's 3X of the annual revenue, you should be able to sell it for around 1.5 to 2 million. That might be the number for you. It just depends. You're 21 though. So, you know what I mean? If you just do what you're doing for the next nine years, you'll be set up for life. Trust me, you're doing just fine. It's just how fast you want it to happen. But I think that would be short-sighted for you to stop what you're doing now. If you go from 30 to 40K a month to 100, you're going to learn so much about hiring, training, recruiting, scaling, staff, ads, that without that experience, I think it would be a detriment to your long-term growth. So think of it right now that you're, you're crawling and you're seeing someone over here run, but I'm like, no, 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 like, like keep crawling, like build your little arm muscles before you get up. Because once you do, you'll be faster than that kid down the road. I, I think you're in a great position. The mentor you spoke to, I understand where he's going, but I don't think he's equating for your skills that you're learning. If you get out now, you won't learn how to manage. You won't learn how to hire. You won't learn how to scale. I, I think it's going to be a detriment. I wouldn't get out right now. I'd at least try to double it minimum. Yeah, no, I, I get that. I do want to learn the skills. Like even sales, I don't love doing sales, but yeah, but, I you, but if you know sales. how, exactly, yeah. exactly. I don't really love managing and hiring all the time, but that's actually the most valuable skill too. Managing. That's yeah. one of the most valuable skills. Does that make sense? Do you have any other questions? I think that's it. That's it? That was okay. Incredibly helpful. Good. No, you're you're a superstar. Just remember at 21, the way you think is not normal. 
in a good way. So what might be happening is sometimes you feel alone or you're talking to people who are much older than you. So I don't know what your mentor is, but let, let's say he's 40, 50, I don't know, but you're 21. So he's giving you advice from 20 more years of life experience. You could mess your life up for the next five years and you'll still be way farther ahead than most. I mean, there's guys I know that they're in their 30s, they still don't have their together you're 21 yeah i get what you're saying but it never feels that way like it never feels but that's like why you'll be successful i feel that way what you could do that might be helpful for you is try to join entrepreneurs organization or try try to join a group oh you know what have you seen chief.co for women look it up it's it's chief.com or chief.co it's a women's um entrepreneur organization like i think you get a lot out of that the other thing i might suggest this is kind of out there but i'm assuming you're in michigan are you still with your parents right now yeah, so milk that for all it's worth for a bit. But eventually, if you want to get in more entrepreneur circles, maybe move out of Michigan. I just spent a month in Medellin. In oh, June. no way. Yes. Do you speak Spanish? No. I was about to say, I was like, she speaks Spanish too. This is the end of the search. Like, and, she's like, and Russian or something. I'm like, okay. Yeah, so Medellin's a good spot. Uh, Bali's a good spot. I was there. Miami, in terms of entrepreneur, is good. It's, it's expensive. Las Vegas has a lot of entrepreneurs in New York. So I think the one thing that I was feeling when I was your age, because I started at 22, I just failed miserably for years. I didn't make, I made $0 for years. So you're so far ahead of me. But I think the biggest thing I struggled with was I just was a little lonely and I didn't really know, I didn't really know where to find people because no one my age was doing what I was doing. Anyways, I'll shut up after this is just what you're feeling is always going to be there, but that's why you're successful. I think you're always going to feel that, but don't, there's nothing wrong with you. That was awesome. Oh, Thank I'm you. so glad you came. You're a sweetheart. Yeah. Tanner basically broke down my numbers, a lot of my mindsets too, and just how to hire, especially for fulfillment and CS. I thought my bottleneck was sales. Turns out my bottleneck is not sales. It's getting a CSM. Well, getting her ramped up and getting out of fulfillment. So yeah, it was just interesting when someone comes in with an outside perspective into your business because they see things that you don't necessarily see or you get told things by different people who don't really know what's going on inside your business and just give like the copy and paste advice. Like you need to keep like doubling your business every month and ramping up ad spend and da 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 da. But when you actually take a look at the numbers and everything, it's like, I can't do that until first I get the CS stuff sorted out. So that was really helpful. I have so much more clarity after that now, because now I feel like I'm clear on what I need to focus on and like what levers I need to pull in order to actually scale. Because the way Tanner broke it down, it's like, it's not a matter of if or how I can really scale. It's just, I need to get this one box checked and then I can ramp up ad spend and, and scale. I need to build more SOPs so that I can get my CSM just ramped up as fast as possible and just maybe spend the next week or two really going hard on training my CSM and making her really good so then after that I can go straight back into sales. For people maybe who have businesses, definitely know your numbers, which is something I haven't been good at doing but have started to become better at because I think business is simple when you break it down and just look at the numbers, otherwise you're just making emotional decisions, which I think is basically what Tanner did. He broke down the numbers and looked at it from that level because he doesn't have the emotion attached in it as like I would. And if you're just starting out, I mean, you just have to dive right in. Nobody really has it figured out. Like nobody has it figured out when they're at 100K or at 10K or at 1K, you're just, it's always just figuring it out as you go, so. Tanner, that was insane. Thank you so much. That was just incredibly helpful. There were so many mindset shifts that I feel like I needed to have that you really cleared up for me. And also just an insane amount of clarity because for the past month, I've been feeling like I've been doing something wrong with sales, but you basically told me why I'm not doing anything wrong. I just need to kind of like reshift my focus a little bit. So that was incredible. Thank you so much.